Welcome back to World History. We're at Roman numeral three, the pursuit of peace. At this point in time, you should have taken both of the quizzes as well as have done both of the, actually three of the homework assignments. So please make sure that you've done all of that. Make sure you don't lose all of that. Be able to turn that in with your packet. Letter A, the Paris Peace Conference. This was the meeting of key leaders to negotiate the peace settlement for World War I. Uh, now, going back a few chapters, remember the Congress of Vienna? That was to deal with Europe after Napoleon. Was the defeated country France allowed to be represented? And the answer is yes. In the Paris Peace Conference, the central powers would not be. Also, Russia, which had dropped out of the war before the end of it, was not invited to the conference either. So at the Paris Peace Conference, the central powers and Russia were not allowed to represent themselves at this conference. Hmm. Losing countries not allowed to participate. Sounds like they're going to be treated fairly, right? Probably not. The main individuals responsible or main individuals involved at the Paris Peace Conference included Woodrow Wilson of the U.S. His plan going into this whole uh, peace treaty was called the 14 points. In fact, Germany had signed the armistice with the idea that Wilson's 14 points would be the basis for the peace treaty. The 14 points, in case you're wondering would not seek revenge upon the defeated powers. Remember, Wilson wanted peace and democracy in America, or in the world, sorry. Of course, that's what the defeated countries were hoping for as well. They would not seek revenge upon the defeated powers. In fact, Wilson arrived in Europe to parades and applause from the people. After all, America had done so much to help out in ending the war. But the diplomats in Paris really didn't care for him. Many considered Wilson to be an idealist and found him often stubborn and preachy. Another individual was Georges Clemenceau of France. He was known as the Old Tiger. He was a cynical and crafty politician. He once said that even God was satisfied with Ten Commandments, but Wilson insists on fourteen. Clemenceau, in short, did not like the 14 points. The thing you need to know about Clemenceau is he desired to keep Germany weak and wanted Germany to pay for the war. He wanted to punish Germany. And then the third individual at this peace conference was David Lloyd George of Britain. He also wanted to punish Germany, but not as severely as Clemenceau. main thing you need to know about him is that he wanted to protect British colonial and naval interests. So let's talk about all of this. There were a total of five treaties signed at the conferences, but the Treaty of Versailles was the most important one. This was the treaty signed between the Allies and Germany. Treaty between the Allies and Germany. And the treaty proved to be very Harsh, indeed. Letter A, territorial provisions. First of all, little letter I, little Roman numeral one. Uh, Germany will lose Alsace and Lorraine to France. Remember, these two territories had been taken from France in the Franco-Prussian War, and now France got them back. Originally, Clemenceau wanted all lands west of the Rhineland, but the rest of the Allies refused. Instead, the extra land called Rhineland would be controlled collectively by the Allies. Little Roman numeral two, little letter II. They reestablished an independent Poland. Poland, which we remember had not existed since 1795, received land from Germany to the east. Little Roman numeral three, little letter III. Germany lost all of its Asian and African colonies. Now look in your books at page 454 and 455. Both of these maps show us the territories that Germany lost. The light green area on page 454 was what was lost. And then on page 455 
the territories that you see in the light green in Asia, as well as the territories, uh, those territories that you see in Africa were at one time all German territories, and now they've lost that to Britain and France and a little bit to Belgium as well. Altogether, the Germans lost 25,000 square miles of territory inhabited by 6 million people. Does that sound like a nice treaty for the Germans? Definitely not. But wait, there's more. Letter B, economic provisions. Germany was required to provide coal to the Allies for 10 years. Germany was also required to give merchant and fishing ships to the Allies. And yet the worst provision had to do with reparations. The definition of the word reparations is payments for war damages. During the conference, Germany was expected to give $5 billion immediately to the Allies, and a special commission would decide how much more it should give later. So $5 billion was enough. Don't worry, they'll find ways to get more money. Sounds pretty bad for the Germans, right? But wait, there's more. Letter C, military provisions. Germany was required to become demilitarized. If you have an idea what that means, it's the opposite of being militarized, so losing the military. Germany, for example, could only have an army of 100,000 men. That was tiny compared to most of the countries of Europe at this time. The army could have no tanks and no large guns. The navy could have no submarines and only six warships, and there were to be no aircraft whatsoever. Sound pretty bad? But wait, there's more. Letter D, the War Guilt Clause. The War Guilt Clause, this is what you need to know, placed blame for the entire war on Germany and its allies. That was the argument for why Germany should be punished so severely. At first, Germany refused to sign the treaty, but when threatened with continual war, a German committee signed the treaty. This anger against the Allies would lead to hate as some Germans demanded revenge for what had happened. Number two, other peace treaties, of course, were created from this conflict. Remember, we talked about how the Treaty of Versailles was just one part of the Paris Peace Conference. Another treaty that was made during this time was the Treaty of St. Germain. The Treaty of St. Germain. This treaty was made between the Allies and Austria, so make sure you know that. Austria lost about three-fourths of its territory and its population. Again, if you look at page 454, it shows you in the light pink color all of the territory that Austria lost. Austria lost some territory to Italy, and the rest of it created new countries, such as Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, and Yugoslavia. One more thing that came about because of this treaty was they were forced to agree not to seek something called Anschluss. That means political unification with Germany. Austria also had to pay reparations and limit the size of its military. Both Hungary and Bulgaria signed similar treaties as well. Letter B, the Treaty of Sevra. The Treaty of Sevra dismantled the Ottoman Empire. In case you were wondering who that was with, I think you just figured it out. The Turks would retain control of Asia Minor and became known as the country of Turkey. If you look at page 455, the map of Africa, well, in the top corner of it, you can see some other territories, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Transjordan, that territory had belonged to the Ottoman Empire, and now they will lose it to the British and the French. Speaking of which, these new territories became mandates. Arabian territories became mandates. Uh, definition of a mandate, territories that would be controlled by Britain and France. Question is, you know, 
where do we get the word Turkey from? The name for the country of Turkey probably originated with the Chinese. Later, the Europeans called anyone who lived in the Ottoman Empire Turk, although the Turks themselves used the term only as a synonym for barbarian. After World War I, however, they finally adopted the name of Turk and called their country Turkey. Hundreds of years ago, Turkish merchants began importing a bird into Europe, which, for lack of a better name, the Europeans called turkeys. When the pilgrims came to North America in the 17th century, they discovered a bird very similar to the turkey. Therefore, they called it a turkey as well. So in case you're wondering, I know you were going to ask anyway. Maybe not. But since you didn't ask, I told you anyways, the history of the term turkey. That's all the information we're going to cover for today. Hope you all have a good rest of the day. Be good, do good. Bye.